Welcome to the European Economic Association Congress in Mannheim. I'm very pleased to be here with Rachel Griffith. When you meet people in the street and they ask you about your, your research, what, what do you tell them about? My work is about gluttony and sloth. It's about trying to understand the rise in obesity and the kinds of behaviors and decisions and habits that people have that are leading them to gain weight. And in particular, to understand the way that governments and policymakers might be able to effectively intervene to change that. So what got you to this question and the relationship with uh, gluttony? Several years ago, a PhD student of mine brought me a picture that showed that there was a reduction in the number of calories that people purchase and bring into their home. I just thought, this, yeah. this can't be true. And so we've spent several years now trying to understand whether that fact is true. Have calories gone up or calories gone down? From reading the news, you'd really think that people were eating more food, being more gluttonous, and that that was a big uh, reason for the rise in obesity. So it turns out people actually are buying more food, they spend more money on food, but they're shifting towards more expensive food. So they're buying more like market produced food rather than cooking food at home. And that's more expensive per calorie. So while they're buying more, actually they're getting fewer calories in the food they're buying because they're substituting from home producing food themselves, so using their own labor to make what they eat, to buying food in the market. It's quite surprising when you think about the rise of obesity because how can you explain then the people gained weight in most countries like the UK but also the US, France and other European countries? It is surprising, I know that's why I kind of didn't believe the PhD student at first. So that's what we do in this work is we say well how can we rationalize that? We see this big increase in weight. In the UK people are about 10 kilos heavier now than they were three decades ago but there's a reduction in calories. So it turns out that gaining weight is because you eat more than you expend in energy. And if you look at the kinds of jobs people do, they do much more sedentary jobs, particularly men. Men used to work in highly active jobs. They'd be bricklayers or burn a lot of energy at work. And now they work in much more sedentary office-based jobs. For women, it's a little bit different. Women used to spend more time doing housework in the home. And actually, that's pretty um, strenuous. It burns a lot of calories. Whereas now they've moved into work and work in like offices again, that's much more sedentary. In the work we've done, we've explained how important the decline and the strenuousness of work is in, in explaining this gain in weight. It's not only work though, it's also uh, the way people travel to work. So people used to ride bicycles, now they drive cars. Um, people watch more TV and other uses of time, but, but work's a big piece of that. And all this decline in uh work activities and in change in work occupation is able to explain the decrease in the increase in obesity and compensate the fact that people eat less calories people are eating more than they're burning so to ask is it calories or is it work i'm not sure that makes sense so i think what's interesting about what we're finding is that the two are very linked so because people are going into work they're no longer spending time at home making food so they're buying market produced food so the kinds of foods they're buying is very related to the fact that they're going into work. A lot of policy interventions that are trying to change the types of foods that people buy or the amount of foods they buy will so change prices or change incomes or something. And in order to understand the effects that those will have, we need to have good models of consumer demand and the things that drive consumer demand. And if work and the kinds of foods people buy are very related, then our models need to reflect that. When we talk about all these taxation policies, taxing snacks, junk food, what do you think about this? Clearly changing the price of a good will you know, lead to people buying less of it. But if we're trying to target something like uh, improving people's diets, you're changing the price of one good and we need to understand what else they'll substitute towards. The other thing, as you know in the work we're doing together, that we really need to think about is the impacts that taxes have on feeding through into um, the, the way that firms change the prices in response to the imposition of the tax. We seem to know that uh, physical exercise into sport is probably not enough to compensate uh, this uh, change in uh, the type of jobs people have. So what kind of other ideas do you, you have in mind? Yeah, this doesn't mean that we shouldn't have policies that target the amount of food people buy. People are buying more calories than they need, then that's why they're getting fat. It's just that it's not that they're buying more calories, they're buying less calories, um, but they're doing even less 
exercise. McKinsey's did a really interesting study last December where they detailed all the different policies around the world that were targeted at obesity, something like 75 different types of policies, and the vast majority of them were targeted at food. A very small number were targeted at food and exercise, like jointly, changing both sides of that equation. And it seems to me that that's really a key area that policy needs to look at. So changing lifestyle brings me to the, this problem also of habit formation. So is the problem of the rise of obesity also a problem of habit formation, that people are not able to adjust very quickly enough when they change their work activities? I think that probably does play a role, and you know, research in that area is very new. There's some interesting work done, for example, in India, suggesting that food you eat in childhood plays a very, you know, has a very long-lasting uh, effect on what you eat later on in life. My guess is that that's an important part of the story we're telling here, that if you look at you know, men in their 60s now, they started their working career in jobs that were pretty strenuous and developed habits of the types of foods that they would eat. And then the labor market changed and they, uh, that became, well, life became less strenuous and they cut down the amount of calories they were eating, but they didn't cut down by enough. And so that's probably about habit formation. Modeling habits, as you know, is very tricky. And I think you know, that's a great area of work, but we don't really know as much as we need to know so about more, that. More research to be done. Definitely more research to be done. There's probably also, you know, in this work, we've looked just at calories in aggregate. We haven't really, uh, we have the data to understand the different changes in the composition of foods. And we definitely see that people are substituting from home produced foods to food uh, outside of the home, which tends to have more sugar and more salt. And there's some evidence that sugar, for example, is more addictive, might be the right word, or more habit would lead to big, stronger habits. And understanding those dynamics is, you know, that's not in the analysis now, but I think that's going to be super important. So, Rachel, what would be the key takeaways from your lecture and your research? I think there's uh, really two key takeaways. One sort of aimed more at policy and one aimed at academic researchers going forward. From a policy point of view, what the work is really saying is that if we want to intervene in markets and in ways that try and um, encourage or incentivize people to eat better and exercise more and not be, gain weight, then we need to think about both sides of activity and food. Looking at one small piece of that is not going to be effective. They're intricately related to each other. And that's sort of similar for the academic work. The thing when we model, when we use modeling tools to evaluate policies or to think about and explain behavior, we really need to take account of both decisions over the kinds of foods people buy and the decisions they make about their working life. And that those things are what we call in economics non-separable. They're related and so we need to model them joint, those joint decisions. We can't model them separately. Thank you very much, Rachel. Yes. Thank you, Pierre. Great to talk to you.